So this is Vodcast 4 for you, 1, uh, dealing with minerals. The objective for this Vodcast is just to get through what the criteria are for a substance to be considered a mineral, and how do these minerals form. So let's just jump right into these criteria. All right. um, a mineral, all right, first off, needs to be solid and needs to be naturally occurring. Okay, the solid's kind of, duh. All right, it's got to be a solid. It can't be a liquid or a gas. The naturally occurring, though, uh, is something that some people don't recognize or forget about. Take a look at these um, rubies on here. All right. One is the naturally occurring. Um, this is how it's mined and found. And then when they are cut and polished, they can look like this. Now, what if I told you one of these is not naturally occurring? The reason for that, one of those is man-made. All right. You can synthesize uh, rubies in a lab, and they are chemically no different. All right, they are the same thing. They just didn't come from a mine. All right, they actually came from a lab. Um, can't really tell the difference, but to be a true mineral, it's got to be naturally occurring, and it's got to be a solid. Secondly, all right, uh, this is table salt. All right, and it's a good example of an orderly crystalline structure. All right. The atoms inside of a salt crystal, if you could zoom in on them, all right, aren't just randomly occurring in different orders. There is a set pattern here that when they're ordered in this pattern, that is a crystalline structure. When you're seeing a crystal, uh, a nice pretty crystal like that original picture I have up there, you're seeing the outward expression of what these atoms are or how these atoms are arranged. Salt crystals tend to be square because the, or cubic, because the atoms, as you can see in the salt crystals, are uh, arranged in a cube form. So it's got to be uh, naturally occurring, solid, and also have this arrangement of, of the atoms. The fourth is a definite chemical composition. Um, that basically means that there is a specific recipe, uh, for example, quartz is one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. That's the chemical composition, and it can't change. So it could be very short, like uh, the quartz over here, or it could be really, really long chemical formula, like the muscovite. Either way, it has a definite chemical composition that this is quartz, this is muscovite. You cannot have uh, something with an identical chemical composition. And the last thing, it's inorganic. The substance to be inorganic can't ever have been alive or part of a living creature. That's why these two things, although chemically identical, the seashells and this uh, calcite mineral, are not both minerals. They're identical chemically. They're both calcium carbonates. This grew uh, deep underground as water precipitated away. This, on the other hand, grew uh, as part of a living creature. So this is uh, considered organic, this is considered inorganic. So this would be a mineral, this would not be a mineral. Now, in your book, it does describe it as generally inorganic because there are some ways you can bend this rule. Let's say with coal, which I'll get to in a bit. Now, how do you get something like that to grow? All right, how do these minerals form? All right, there are four ways that they can form. Uh, some of them are very similar. First off, crystallization of magma. What does that mean? So you take magma, which is basically melted rock, all right, and you cool it down. And as it cools down, those atoms will uh, attract one another. They will bond together and make a mineral. All right, and they will precipitate out of this uh, magma and form crystals of whatever. Uh, you could also, instead of magma, you could have kind of the same thing where water is carrying around a bunch of dissolved minerals like um, calcium carbonate. And when that uh, calcium carbonate leaves solution, all right, so it's dropped off, kind of like if you leave salt water out, eventually the water evaporates away, leaving behind the salt. The same thing happens uh, with water and minerals that are dissolved in it. Um, <clears throat> these, This is a picture of stalactites. Stalactites occur when uh, rainwater, groundwater, uh, precipitates uh, out calcium carbonate. A third
third way is pressure and temperature. Again, I've mentioned that coal can be considered a mineral. Coal started off at something like this, peat. And you can see inside of this peat, there are sticks and leaves and stuff that just kind of been smushed together. Well, as you bury this peat under enough heat and pressure, it'll actually transform into something like this. It's called lignite coal. So pressure and temperature can also uh, cause minerals to form. And the last uh, way is through hydrothermal solutions. Uh, if you've never been to Yellowstone, this is Old Faithful. That's a geyser that goes off every 60 to 90 minutes. And these are hydrothermal um, features. Very, very hot water, deep underground, is carrying lots of uh, minerals and dissolved in, in solution. And when they interact with the, the field rock, the original rock that's there, it can actually swap out minerals and change all right, uh, some of that parent rock. Uh, it can also get to the surface and leave all kinds of weird features out. But that is the fourth and final way that uh, minerals can form. So you have through magma, you had through um, uh, precipitation of water, heat and pressure, and hydrothermal solutions. So that covers everything that you need in your notes for uh, this objective, knowing what a mineral is and how they form.